No, I don't want to join the audio. I mean, you know, when they get the Okay, this meeting is being recorded because we're starting. If you're wondering where you are today, you're listening to the Materials Management uh, and Climate Change webinar here on the 10th of June, 2020. I'm Alan Pennington, a Waste Reduction Coordinator with Marion County. And um, I'm gonna take you through this uh, little talk and I hope it uh, opens up some new ideas in, in your mind and also helps you understand some of the changes that are coming uh, and some of the focus areas that we're going to be devoting to here 
um, in the near, well, in the future, and now and in the future, I should say. Also, I want you to know that this is being recorded, so it will be anything you write in the chat box will be recorded, or if we hear your voice, um, it'll also be that way. But generally, most folks are, because we have so many folks, it is, it is muted for all, almost all of you. I also want to say that uh, if you have a question that arises during this, if you can kind of wait towards the end and send that chat, um, that chat box is kind of like a text box. If you could write the question there, if you can kind of say towards the end, we will have time for question and answers there. Because I have a feeling this is going to raise a lot of points to a lot of you. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll answer that then. Okay. And also at the very end, there is a, uh, you'll also have access to this uh, webinar in the future. So you'll be able to get, uh, see, see the slides. And uh, there's a lot of links also that are mentioned in here that you may want to go back and explore. So with that said, I want to get started. And I want to think about, go to the next slide. So the first slide I want to talk about, the obvious um, one you've all seen probably since uh, probably maybe the fifth grade, sixth grade, talking about the atmosphere. Just a quick review. The atmosphere is made up of oxygen, a lot of other stuff, but it's also got these gases, CO2, nitrogen, methane, uh, CFCs that can affect how thick that atmospheric uh, ability is to let the heat back out that comes in from the sun. The thicker that blanket is, the hotter it gets. And that's what we're experiencing today. So I'll leave it at that. We're going to cover these things. We're going to look at materials and greenhouse gases. Then some, and then we're going to look at kind of where they're coming from. And then we're going to look at some strategies that are on our end. Because I do, you know, I work for environmental services. Um, we, we, our, our world, our wheelhouse is all about um, solid waste, the materials that come into Marion County and how we deal with them. So how we look at that and what actions can we take as a society, a government, business, an individual can do to uh, reduce the impact of greenhouse gases through our materials. So what then are we talking about? Well, I'm going to read this with you because materials management is an approach to using and reusing resources most efficiently and sustainably throughout their life cycles. It seeks to minimize materials and use and all associated environmental impacts, which is, if you think of that we're looking at this, this is quite a break from us looking at just what comes in out of the, the, the yard debris, you know, the yard debris, the garbage, the recycling, the things that come get picked up at your home, your business, your organization across this whole country. Uh, so we're going to be looking beyond just those, that part of the, the uh, materials. So what am I talking about here? When I talk about materials, I'm talking about everything. This could be, you know, from, from the raw materials that make these items, um, you know, to all the stuff up there from, you know, cell phones to packaging to, you know, concrete. Look at the concrete on the left. We're going to talk about concrete later. I know you all want to talk about concrete this morning. So this is, this is a great graph. There's a lot there. Um, it's looking at our use of materials over the last, um, well, about 110 years there. So from 1900 to 2009. And you'll see that that orange line is the use of materials measured in thousand metric tons. So this would be the materials we're talking about here would be fossil fuels, biomass, which is, you know, anything that grew, ores and non-metallic uh, minerals. So those would be construction minerals. You know, think about what's in concrete or, or what's in sheetrock. So, um, you know, when, when you think of that then, so the, the lines here, mining and uh, producing these materials take a lot of energy, which you know comes from generally fossil fuels. And since we know that burning fossil fuels produces greenhouse gases and contributes to climate change, then it stands to reason that burning fossil fuels produce materials also contributes to uh, climate change. And from this graph, you can you can see that they do. The blue line shows that it's the um, carbon emissions from in a million metric tons over the same period. That shows a very similar trend, not a surprise there. And I want you to pay attention from say 
1970 on, 1960 on. Look at both of those lines. Because what's shocking is that in the last 50 years, um, humans on this planet have consumed more resources than all the previous materials in history. And our economy shows that it's, you know, it's pretty much, we're tied to global markets for these materials. And, you know, all the competition for these materials and prices for them are increasing. So big impact here. And so the materials we're using are also changing. About 41% of the materials that we used in the United States back in 1900 were renewable. By 1995, that percentage had dropped to 6%. Six per, only 6% 6 were renewable. And that means that we are depending, our economy is fundamentally depending on these materials that are not sustainable. And if we're doing that, then that's not only is not sustainable and has in, impacts on our economy, but also our national security. And that's one of the reasons why the Pentagon over the last oh, I would say 10, 15 years, has also looked at um, electronic waste uh, as an alternative source of, of rare metals because basically most of those rare metals are locked up in the soils and in the, in the rocks over in China. So think about all those things like you're, what you're looking at right now are made up of a lot of components that have those metals in them. So also, we've seen that there's been a rapid rise over in the last 50 years, which have had not only global gas uh, impacts that are affecting our climate, but think about the impacts from toxic chemicals to acidification, think about acid rain, um, soil fertility on the decrease, um, nutrient imbalances, things are going askew in our waters and oceans, resource depletion and uh, decline in biodiversity. Why are there so many animals on the endangered species list? And of course, that's all on the, an, an, what we consider to be a natural capital, uh, but it's, which is critical for our economy and our livelihood. So let's take a look then at these uh, greenhouse gas emissions and try to figure out what materials that we're talking about. Here's a slide from uh, 2006, a little dated, uh, but there's a reason for that because they, it's, yeah, it's beyond the scope of this. But um, it, if we were to look at these emissions, it would be pretty darn similar. This uh, is pretty much unchanged uh, when you look at these sectors. Um, and, and so these are, these are the way they're all divvied up, but there's no really materials on this in this chart. And you'll notice that of all these um, things that were um, here, there's, about a 2% which comes from our waste. So greenhouse gas emissions from our waste, primarily in the form of putrefaction of the uh, organic compounds that we're putting in there. You think of food waste, uh, wood scrap, anything that's organic that's gonna break down over time is going to make either carbon dioxide or methane gas. So, we're looking at that as a small impact compared to everything else. But let's take a look of where this is having impacts elsewhere. Um, if we're trying to find those materials, we see that they're scattered all across the board there. So it's not just one category. These things tend to, you know, whether we're talking about, I mean, we, we could take that plastic bottle, but that was also not always a manufacturer, but had to be transported. It doesn't necessarily always show up easily on these graphs. So let's take this and look at it in another way using those same numbers and divide it up into um, what we call the materials management piece, looking at dividing it up this way. So we've got that provision of goods and provision of food, which is, these are the materials now that, we've been, that we wanna talk about, and they make up about 42%. That's in our, this is what we're talking about that's in our wheelhouse. This is, these are the materials that are gonna to come to us somehow to be decided whether it's gonna end up in a landfill, recycled, recovered, or composted, right? And so that's about 42% of that. The other about 50% of that goes into passenger transport and into lighting, as you can see. Um, so I want to go to another one, 
when we look at this one a little bit closer, we can really divide up and see when we're talking about uh, goods and foods, and you put that into looking at the production piece, the production of those food, that food and those goods products that creates 42%, 33% of that is in production of it. So just making the stuff that has a huge impact. So think about this one out of every three greenhouse gases up in the atmosphere floating around or in our oceans, then are, um, have gotten there from just producing stuff. The other 7% is from shipping distribution. So when you think of that, those two, that shipping and distribution and that production, which would be, you know, the mining, the raw materials, the manufacturing, that's a big chunk. And only 2% of that is going to be, again, from landfill and, and waste. So we've got this huge carbon footprint here, and we know that we want to reduce that impact of those because this isn't really, we're not, again, we're not really looking so much as the transport and, and building piece. We're looking at those materials. How do, we, how do we do that? And are we focusing on the right things? Are we doing that properly? So where are we focusing our, our efforts right now? Well, before we get just to that answer, I want to look at this for example. This is a simple uh, material life cycle chart. Uh, these are pretty cool because you can see, for example, if you go to about, this was a clock, look at about nine o'clock over here. You can see where it says resource extraction. So that's where it would begin, right? You're digging something up, you're mining something, you're, you're siphoning petroleum out of the oceans maybe or out of Texas. And uh, you're going to suck all that stuff up and then you're gonna put it in and you're gonna, you're gonna make something out of it, right? You're producing things. And then you're going to distribute it and send it around and people are gonna use it up. And finally, it comes to right down here, the end of life management. This is where we make that big decision. Recycle, recover, compost, or dispose. But the problem is that's where we've always been focusing, not that other piece. But when, when, we, when we get to that, we start going, okay, that's 2% that's of our total greenhouse gas emissions. Let's look at that other part. And so that's why we want to look at that life cycle, what we call the upstream parts, where all that stuff was produced and extracted and consumed further upstream. So that's where we want to focus our efforts. And we know that all materials follow a, a pretty much a general life cycle. Here we're looking at concrete. I told you we we're going to get to concrete. Um, and this is, a, this is a high impact uh, material. And you'll see that little logo down at the left bottom corner there, the little truck. Um, there is a group called the West Coast Climate Forum which has worked with all the uh, governments this be through the EPA and state and local governments all along the West Coast. They've been looking at um, coming up with some tools to deal with this, trying to find some answers to how we best handle these materials. And this is one of the high impact materials because it, you know, concrete is used so extensively and has been friggin' forever uh, since even the Roman times, but we just use a lot of it. So it means it's gotta be, you know, it's this extraction piece. We've got to you know, get it from the rock, We've got to process it, make it, distribute it, use it. And then we have to figure out to either dispose it or, or recycle it. So what can we do? Well, so example, some of the things that they've come up with is uh, maybe we can, we can do stuff like use less concrete, for example, by putting other materials in there that wouldn't normally be used that are, are inert are possibly making concrete that can be disassembled and reused as opposed to just, you know, poured in place and, 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 and what, at a one time use, think of it as something that's at some point going to be extracted and reused, or maybe making sure that we use, always use recycled content. So if we take old concrete out, let's make sure and put that back in the mix because we've already made, used up all those resources to make it in the first place. So Again, so one of the things that DEQ and others have done is they've looked at uh, ways to reduce these material greenhouse gases. And <clears throat> what, can, what, where should we be uh, looking at, you know, focusing on? And they come up with this list of starting from 
you know, you know, we look at that reduce, reuse, recycle. Here's the easiest down to the probably the hardest, right? I, I would say. And um, these are all methods that we can use to reduce impacts. So let's start with recycling. That's probably the best known. It's the one that, you know, we've spent a lot of time in uh, environmental services focusing on over the years. And we know that recycling has a huge, um, uh, it's, it, it's, it's hugely successful uh, in a sense. It, uh, it, it does have a big impact on greenhouse gases as far as conserving energy. And that's one of the reasons why it's so beneficial. And so we've, you know, we've been responsible for promoting that for some time. And if you look at this chart, you know, between the difference between the purple and the blue, that, that purple represents the, you know, the virgin material that's just brand spanking new and the blue would be a recycled and about energy inputs. And when you look at those aluminum cans and you go, wow, there is just no comparison. Using recycled aluminum saves so much energy because you think of it, the aluminum comes from bauxite and bauxite is a hard to extract material. Uh, they've dug up the whole southern part of the United States looking for that stuff. Um, and then turning it into aluminum is also a huge amount of energy to do that. So again, that energy savings and you go across and, and even no matter what the material is, it does have a, a positive attribute to use recycling materials whenever we can. And it's very cost effective. We've already got these programs set up, right? It's in your curve. Every, everybody here can do it. Hopefully they do it properly, right? As you all are want to do, right? So any way we can reduce greenhouse gases, we want to do it. So looking at this, this uh, um, group decided, a lot of the groups got to sit with uh, the uh, Oregon Department of Environmental Quality and the West Coast Forum and all these others, anywhere from California up to Washington took a look at these, um, what we're already recycling and said, okay, where, where should we focus? What's the biggest impact? And what, you know, looking at what we already have in place here. And so these are the top four that they've got in here. So carpet is the number one because carpet is typically made of, um, you know, it's made of, of a lot of fossil fuels materials in there. And so it has a lot of value to get that one back. We don't, have any carpet uh, recovery places here in Oregon, but they do have some. They've been experimenting with that down in California. And then, of course, the core recyclables, this, these are the things we've been getting for years, right? You know, cans, uh, number one and two plastics, cardboard and paper, okay? Those are, those are still have a high value, and we want to continue getting those. Dimensional lumber, again, in the construction world, and then food scraps is a huge one, right? So those, these are all things that we really want to focus on. And again, thinking about recycling, because it's, it's an important action, but there are limits to it. So if we look at this graph and go across from 60 on up to the current day, we see then that um, You'll, you'll notice that as you get across to 2014, looking at in the last 20, you know, last 20 years to 2000, that recycling number, that graph doesn't really change much. We've kind of plateaued. And, but the, the garbage has still gotten pretty big about total waste generated. And we do pretty well on the West Coast. We get about 50% of our recyclables overall, over, you know, trend over the last you know, few years. But the, the rest of the country lags. I mean, but overall, the country goes anywhere from 30 to 35 percent recycling rate. So we're just not getting enough of the stuff. We, we're missing a bunch. But let's imagine this. Let's imagine that we are going to capture every single thing. If we could get every uh, hypothetically possible recyclable, what would be the benefit of that? Well, these guys looked at that. And this is the slide over here. The one on the left is the one we've been looking at, provisions and materials. Those are our material management piece. And that's with a 32% recovery rate. That's about what we're doing right now of collecting. But if we got everything, the one on the right shows that it would have a huge impact and we would save 6% of our greenhouse gas emissions. That's good, but it's not gonna get us, it's not gonna reverse climate change, okay? Um, we just we we have to do better and just to, to bring that home um guys that made this they this uh, slideshow they threw this in here it's necessary but it's inefficient 
uh, not insufficient. So if you look at this picture, these are um, these are called auklets, and these little beach birds all started washing up on the shores about oh I think it was 2014. Uh, thousands of these things died, and they all the way from California up to British Columbia. So we're trying to figure out why are these guys showing up. They are basically, uh, you know, there was a lot of lot of theories out there that maybe it's you know, ingesting plastic or you know whatever straws up their nose, whatever. Uh, it turns out that these guys died from a um, from climate change. So basically, what's happened? There was this huge blob of of hot water that came up off the coast, the west coast during that uh, during that period, and that blob basically. Uh, inverted the the food chain out there and so the, the marine food that normally would rise up to the surface wasn't allowed to get there because the hot water was keeping it out and so it, it just they just starved to death and so we had all of these birds died and again this is a, a cause and effect of climate change on our planet so we need to move just beyond recycling. We need to do recycling wherever we can but we need to look up at our next R which would be reuse. So let's take a look at reuse here. And we look at here, this is a nice little graph here that DEQ did some time ago. They did a study here. And they, um, you know, took, if you took a plastic bottle, one bottle, and you just disposed it, you'd get 100% of all those greenhouse gas emissions would just go into the atmosphere, right? But if you, and that was one that was just, just made, right? But if you took that bottle and you recycled it, made another one, you would reduce those greenhouse gas emissions because you were using um, part of that material to make something new, but there's still a lot of emissions going into making something new from recyclables. But what if you just used, reused your water bottle or your glass at home and just drank out of the tap? Well, if you do that, then you don't need all those plastic bottles, okay? You've got that tap water and you know, and, and Living over here, you know, for the folks here that live in Salem, uh, you, we get this beautiful water from North San Diem. Portland's blessed with the, uh, you know, uh, the waters up there, Eugene. I mean, we're all, we're doing, we get pretty good water over here in uh, this part of the world. So it's crazy to be using water out of a plastic bottle. So in this case, reuse has all the, uh, all the pluses. Let's see here, my little guys don't all work here. And then the other R, reduction, is the best. And I want to show you something here looking at two different items. Now, when we talk about different items, if we're talking about shipping something from point A to point B, a lot of us instinctively say, well, I want to use something that I can recycle. For example, a cardboard box is better than a plastic uh, shipping container. Okay, so because this thing, the plastic is, well, it's plastic. We don't, we've been taught to kind of dislike plastic and we know that it can't be recycled, so it's ug. And so we don't want to use that, we're going to use the other one. But those shipping boxes have a much higher uh, greenhouse gas imprint, uh, footprint, than do those plastic ones, even if they can be recycled. It really doesn't help that much. In fact, the materials to go in to make those little plastic bags have a much lower environmental footprint, even if it is made right out of petroleum and it can't be recycled. So in this case, it really seems that reduction is the key because it all becomes comes down to this, materials matter. The more mass, the more, if you want to think of just material that's in something, means that it has more of an impact on greenhouse gases than something that has less. So again, looking at food items, because we all like to also uh, want to compost whenever we can, if we took a certain amount of food, a ton of food, and stuck it on, you know, out into a landfill, as it breaks down, it releases gases. It releases uh, carbon dioxide and methane what's in a landfill. If we compost it, we get some benefit here. Um, so we look at this guy, we get, that's the one we're talking about. So you get, a, a, you get a, this great product, 
and you've reduced the amount of potential greenhouse gases that we get up into the atmosphere versus throwing the landfill. But what if we don't waste it at all? What if we consume it all and we don't let it go either to the landfill or get composted? Well, obviously, if you look at that, the amount of uh, potential greenhouse gases that are avoided are as good as it can be because nothing gets wasted there. So that's a huge plus, and that's what we want to see. So one of the things that the, this, uh, the group worked on was creating this uh, toolkit because food waste is so impactful. This, they made it, came up with this one called Food Too Good to Waste. And by the way, you can find all this on the Marion County website, uh, mcrecycles.net. You can find all this. Um, and so they were looking at these. These are, are tools that you and I can do to keep this food scraps from ending up into the, into the garbage. Because we know that approximately 25% um, of all the food waste in this country is coming from your, out of your home and my home because we're wasting bits and pieces of food every day that gets tossed. So we know that's because we've gone through your garbage, uh, you know, not you in particular, but we've done studies to find out what's in the garbage in Marion County. And, and from the residents, it's about 25% of it, the garbage is food. And, the, uh, and in, in the commercial sector, it's almost 30%. So we're wasting a lot of stuff. You can see that graphic down below. And so they also came up with a food recovery hierarchy. Uh, you can see that up here. And the, the best thing we can do is reduce food waste at the very beginning by reducing what gets lost. That is the best one. And then we look down, we get feed hungry people, animals, and so on. So this is a good, good way to, to be thinking about what we can do in our homes and whatnot. And of course, these guys are good about doing studies. And I love this one. So looking at this, uh, there's a little hospital food service. This is a, a medium-sized medical center over in Wisconsin, about 400 patients, but they serve their staff and the guests. They do about almost 3,000 meals a day. And they found out that they were throwing away about, a, oh, about 1,000 pounds a week uh, of food waste. And so they said, okay, what can we do to change this? So they, they made some, some changes. They, one of the things that they did is they just, how they prepped their, their vegetables to encourage less scrap waste. Um, they started heating smaller portions of their soups because they found out people weren't eating, drinking all their soups, eating all their soups. And just, just other little things that they, ch they made changes to and they had a dramatic impact. They cut their food waste in half, which resulted in um, $25,000 a year cost savings. So it's really, it's really not that hard to do. It just takes that mindfulness to do that. So then I'm going to ask a question here because my next slide is going to be um, about buildings. And I, I want to pass this on. So I'm going to read this to you. Buildings are also a huge part of the materials we all use. Leave it at that. And, um, and here's another thought. If you take all the municipal solid waste in the United States, so that's what's coming out of all you know the regular stuff people throw away uh, from in their homes and the businesses for each each community, and you take that amount and you multiply it times two, that would equal the amount of construction and demolition debris that's generated in the United States every day, every year. Excuse me, every year. So. How do we reduce the impacts of that, of those materials that are creating to their greenhouse gas emissions? There's two things. I want you to think of them. I'm going to sing the Jeopardy final. Actually, Jessica, will you help me with this? The do, 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 do. Okay, never mind. We don't have to. And we could sing happy birthday to Jessica. It is her birthday. Happy birthday, Jessica. Um, but anybody guess yet what the first strategy or a strategy would be? I know you're thinking, okay, so here's the first one. I'm going to give you. Look at that one. Size matters. In this case, using less. Because look at these, look at these numbers, you guys. The size of the home over the last 58 years, according to this, is almost tripled, yet the family size has gone down. That's crazy. You know, by going smaller homes or using less you know, uh, 
uh, fewer homes, smaller homes, uh, we get, it reduces both materials and energy. Okay, so that's why we want, that's a, one of the best things you could do to build a greener home is make it smaller. And um, so this, it's, you know, it's, and it's also how we're, we're, we're using our homes. You know? So what, what, what could we do here? Well, one of the things that, you know, we could do as a, as a civilization is to encourage, for example, smaller homes, tiny homes, ADU units, it's, and then you know, that's all comes in the zoning. Um, what is the city of Salem? What's city of Kaiser? What's state? And what do they say about this? How can we reduce that? And then the second strategy. Okay, give up, time's up. Reuse building materials. In other words, all the materials that are out there that are still good, let's use them because that carbon's already been locked up into those boards of cement, all those materials, how are we going to use them? That's a plus. Um, Portland has passed a deconstruction, their second version of it. And so their, their law is that any home that's or building that was built in 1940 or earlier has to be deconstructed if you want to take it apart there's been a lot of McMansions being built coming in and tearing down perfectly good houses um, and uh, and just to put in a bigger home there in Portland so this will also by getting saving those materials again having those materials available for reuse not only does it save those greenhouse gases but it means that you can use those materials to have a lower impact for you as well so Another way is what we purchase, because what we buy, we're kind of stuck with it. I mean, you may buy a, a, a car and you find out later you don't really like, there's things about that car you don't like, about the house you don't like, or the pair of shoes you got, whatever. Um, but you're stuck with them uh, a lot of times. So when we look at things and what we buy, we have this you know, possibility to, to buy something that has a, a lower impact on greenhouse gas emissions, but also you know, how does it affect not only energy, but water consumption? You know, is it water efficient? What about toxics? Does it have a lot of toxics in it? Is it gonna make your people sick? Or is it, is it adding to our, our, our burden of toxics on the environment and the, and the planet? And does it maybe have recycled content? You know, all these attributes that we wanna think about when we buy that. And we, and those of us in the public area, we have a huge impact because I read somewhere that between the federal government and the local governments, it's like we're like the third largest or fourth largest country on the planet from what our purchasing power, because we just buy and consume so much stuff. So again, this uh, climate friendly purchasing toolkit that the West Coast uh, Summit Group has put together has been, uh, this is, these are the focus areas here. And again, I'm gonna give you the link to this later on. But these are the focus areas that, uh, that they, they, they uh, come up with all sorts of, you know, well, here's the problem, here's what we can do about it, and you can do about it, and I can do about it. So I wanna think about one of those areas there that, uh, not, not concrete this time, but I wanna look at asphalt. Um, Eugene did a, the city of Eugene did this little study looking at that. And so they came up with um, this, they, they took this, uh, warm mix asphalt. It's a warm mix asphalt is this asphalt that uh, you, you don't have to heat it up. You know, typically when you, when you go buy a, a vehicle or one of these guys where they're laying down new asphalt, you can just feel the heat there where, they're, where they're, that asphalt has to be heated up to be put down into the bed. But and it's super hot. But if this warm mix, can you can reduce those temperatures by 50 degrees, which is quite a bit. And by reducing the energy inputs to that, you can save 50% of your energy if it works. And so they did a five year study there so that they could you know, make it, lay it down and then compare it to ones that were similar, but not, um, you know, that didn't have that warm mix and say, how did it hold up? And they, they were happy with the results. So now the city of Eugene, if you want to build a, a road there, you, you, uh, it re they required that you use this warm mix uh, for their city paving project. So again, using the, the that, uh, buying power to encourage folks to use something that has a better environmental impact. Which gets us to this piece right here. We come down to the consumption. That's, and this is, this is the toughest one, you know, really reducing consumption. That was number seven on that list of one through seven that we got to earlier. 
and just getting people to use <clears throat> use less stuff, buy less mm -hmm. stuff, because it's the cornerstone of our economy. I mean, the, you know, when George Bush was asked what should Americans do, he said go shopping. Um, that's that's a, there's a problem with that because we also know that not only is it a cornerstone of our economy, but we also know it's a fundamental driver of you know, climate change and resource depletion and, and, and pollution on the planet. So we've got to figure out some better ways because it, consumerism really, it just dominates our, our culture because they're always, you know, just encouraging us to buy stuff. Um, in fact, this gizmo that you're looking at is, you know, you go to any website and there's these little ads that pop up. Um, another little study has found that uh, happiness uh, you know, the, the old Beatles song, Can't Buy Me Love. Well, you can't necessarily buy happiness through buying. There is a certain amount of that that happens to some people. They've done these measurements of happiness. But once people get to where they've met their basic needs with buying stuff, the more the stuff they buy, the less it makes them happy, um, which is interesting. So here's, here's a quote that I really like. It says, we keep spending money we don't have for things we don't need to impress people we don't know, which, you know, I, I agree with that. It's, uh, it's phenomenal, but, you know, fashion. So what can we do here? Is, there, is it just doomed? Well, there are some positive trends here. One of the things that's uh, interesting, sometimes millennials get, a, get, a, uh, get uh, kind of made fun of in some ways, but, you know, one of the cool things that they are doing typically is they're driving less and they own fewer cars as a group. Uh, in my generation, you know, that's all we thought about is turning 16 and owning a car. And a lot of these guys are not rushing out to even get their driving license. So that's, that says a lot. And then also the, the possibility to share goods and services, like, like that tool library you see up there. Uh, I know we've been talking to locally to the Salem Kaiser Library, and I think they will be open to getting one of these there once they move back into their building. They've got a lot, they've, they've got other issues right now, but there's also, you know, ride share. There's all sorts of things that can happen. And then there's, there's you know, reuse. You look at that iFixit site. If you've ever come across a, uh, an electronic gizmo and you're just ready to toss it away because there's something wrong with it, I suggest you go to iFixit.com and take a look there because they have all sorts of information and ways and tools to help you fix your own product. And there's also a, a lot of places out there that can repair your stuff now. I know Marion County, we also have encouraged uh, uh, repair fairs and there's all sorts of stuff online now. And man, you can go to YouTube and just about get anything fixed if you wanna try that do, your, do it yourself um, type of mentality. And of course there's you know, even companies like uh, Patagonia that you know, emphasize, you know, don't buy this uh, jacket. And, worn wear and all these uh, things to try to encourage people to buy, um, uh, you know, thinking about that with mindfulness. Again, the Climate Action Toolkit is there. Um, and these are the things that they've got. And again, you, this will be available to you to find later. And these are the things that we've covered today, looking at materials and greenhouse gases and strategies. We didn't really get into climate action plans. That's a, a lot of other stuff. I know the city of Portland's done that. Uh, Salem's trying to do that. Uh, they're starting to work on that, but it will really give you some, again, coming up with some tools that the local governments can do to, to reduce their greenhouse gas uh, impacts. And so we looked at these and I have just a, the last few short slides. Just more, these are more just like your moment of zen. So looking at this, uh, the linear economy, that's kind of what we have right now. You, you extract it, you make it, and you throw it away. And then there's a recycling economy where you get a little bit more out of it by recycling it a bit. But the circular economy is the ideal economy where stuff is not designed to be thrown away. Anybody know what that is? If you've been in any of my uh, master recycler classes the last couple of years, you've seen this. Um, this is this represents the amount of space a one ton of CO2 takes up at just a little bit above sea level. Just to give you an idea. This is not a circular economy result. Reuse. <clears throat> so
So thank you so much for attending. Um, we're gonna go over some questions. I think we maybe we've got some. Uh, Jessica, do you have some stuff over there? I don't have the chat up. We don't have too many questions. Jay um, did ask about, do we have any, uh, like ha other than Habitat for Humanity restores or any places here in Marion County to get reused building materials? Do we have them? Um, pretty much that's it. Um, hopefully that will, you know, at, at some point we'll be able to uh, help, help them expand. It would be great if, if uh, we could support that. When you think of the city of Eugene has their brain, which is pretty large and they're, they're about, they're almost exactly the same size as we are. Uh, it stands to reason that we could support something like that, um, but it just depends on the organization that's gonna step up but it would be great to, to expand on that. Yeah, Christine um, Scaffa, I'm hoping I'm saying your name right, mentioned that uh, she's actually from Bring and she shared her, her email address if anybody has more questions about that. But we highly recommend going there for a tour. They do amazing work. Uh-huh, they do, absolutely. Um, and then Victor is asking about what can be done about plastic packaging that comes in the, um, the door when with almost every purchase um, and maybe you could go back to that thing the graph that you showed about the the boxes versus the plastic packaging too yeah going back there let me see if I can do that okay let's go back to uh, right here so, uh, Victor, if you'll look at this one, uh, this, this, I mean, this isn't exactly what you were saying, though. I, I realize, Victor, you were talking about the stuff you buy uh, that post you know, we're looking at recycled content. You know, if, let's, let's imagine that if, if all those guys who were manufacturing that stuff put it in a cardboard box or a paper box of some sort versus that little plastic container, it probably would still, it would have a higher impact um, with, that, with that box versus that plastic piece. Um, the problem is though, we, we, we've been teaching folks so, you know, to recycle really well and they were recycling that, a lot of those plastic components, thinking that they could recycle them and they really can't anymore uh, because it's, there's just, they just, they, they just don't work um, in the system. So, it is, it is a problem. The only thing I can think of, you know, it's, it's, again, it's a consumer choice, which is never a great answer because it's so hard when everything is covered. Um, but wherever you can buy in bulk, do so. You know, I, I personally shop at places where I can go to bulk bins and get items out of there, whether it's food or, or um, other products that are available, whether you're talking about laundry soap or, or dish soap or whatever, those kind of things. So, don't have a great answer for you, Victor. Um, they are still accepting, right, Alan, uh, at the grocery stores, the plastic film, though? They are. You can take it there. All the Freddy's and uh, Roth's and so forth will take it. Right. Uh, Judy also wanted to point out that there's building materials at Arnwood Naturals, the Rebuilding Center in Portland, and Salem Salvage mm -hmm. as well. Um, and then Lindsay has a question about where she can drop off compostables like food scraps. Since she lives in an apartment in Kaiser, she tries to do a little bit of composting on the balcony, but the volume's way more than what worms can eat. So she's already tried vermicomposting, which is awesome. Good job trying that. Yeah, so um, I, I feel your pain. I, uh, I was in a, an apartment for a while and I was also collecting food scraps. And so what I had to do was um, take them to a friend's house and put them in their uh, bin. It, it could be if you're in a place like a, uh, an apartment, if you ask your, whoever owns the apartment building, whoever runs it, uh, it's up to them to, um, to ask their haulers for one of those containers. Um, Unfortunately, very few of them agree to do that. That's the problem. So it's, it's a rarity when they do that. But uh, it is available should they choose to do it. But that's all I got for you.
Yeah, and um, Victor is asking about, or just restating that, yeah, manufacturers wrap everything in plastic. Um, and that's absolutely true, but perhaps people can also um, do the old letter writing or post on social media when you see an excessive amount of plastic and you know tag that company and ask them why. Um, I think the more we can do that and hold companies accountable, the better we'll be. Uh, another great question, um, Phil Donahue is, I don't know if that's the real name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I bet he gets that a lot. Well, I feel like I need to put a microphone in your face now. Um, is there any information or data on how much Amazon has affected pollution in micro deliveries and packaging? Well, that's a great question. I, uh, I, uh, I don't know. Um, I, I, uh, it's, I think it's still too new um, in the area, at least in this area, whether that's uh, you know, something that will be studied. But my guess is that there will be people who will be looking at good old Amazon. Um, so, uh, someone also asked, Carol asked about, is the webinar recorded? How can they get the link later, Alan? Well, it is being recorded and uh, you can get it. It will be posted on the mcrecycles.net uh, website. You'll see when you open up that page, it will take you right in the middle of the page there. It will say uh, virtual events and you click on that and then you will find this webinar there. So you can go back and see all these, you know, the links and whatever. And, you know, if you're just really having a hard time falling asleep at night, you can just listen to my dulcet tones and it will just put you out. Anything else, Jessica? Um, do you know how much recycled material goes into government construction, like the police station? No, uh, I don't. And uh, that would be, that's, uh, that's a, a great question, but and I don't know. I mean, those are, those are individual projects. We look at, uh, you know, our we're much larger scope. We only have data from the whole county. So. Uh, also, I just want to apologize to Phil Donahoe, not Do Q. Sorry, I can't read, apparently. <laughs> I apologize for butchering your name. Um, are there any other questions in the chat that anybody wants to add? Um, there has been some talk about the plastic film or plastic bag recycling at um, local grocery stores, and that's something we could try to look into, too. Um, I guess they're saying Ross and Staten is accepting plastic film, also Winco, but not right now some Fred Myers. So just keep an eye out on that. You know, they could possibly be at Fred Myers. They might have moved it. Um, I, that'd be worth checking into. Um, the, again, those little bags that they, because they, uh, they do produce them, they do make them, they, they're, um, they still have some value. And, you know, they, they, they can take those bags and turn them into some other product, particularly, you know, we think of the, the Trex deck boards that they make out of those. They, they use an incredible number of those little plastic bags. So uh, just as long as they're, you know, dry and clean, uh, yeah. it's a good material still. Cheryl um, said that she asked customer service at Freddy's in South Salem and they said no. So it's very interesting. Um, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how, um, if it's COVID playing a part in that uh, market or not. I'm not yeah. sure. Interesting. I didn't, that's, uh, I haven't been going in there uh, just because I haven't been going into grocery stores, but um, yeah. Interesting. Any yeah. other questions? We have a few more minutes. Okay. Well, I also want to invite you guys all, we're going to be having another webinar on uh, J July 1. It's going to be on composting. And just, it's again, it's just a look at basic composting. Uh, just, you know, what you're doing in your backyard or if you've got questions about that uh, or just, you know, what is the process? A lot of you have been to composting facilities and seen them. So there's, uh, you know, there's, there's, we'll also cover a little bit of that and how that all works. So I think you'll find it interesting and um, just want to invite you to that. I believe it's at, I think it's at 11 on the July 1st. 
Uh, and they can all go to the mcrecycles.net for the virtual events link. And we have a bunch of events up there, um, as well as past events that people can download um, the recordings or listen on um, to learn more. Just seeing if there's any other questions. Many plastic bottles say do not reuse. Any thoughts about that, Alan? Many, many plastic bottles say do not reuse? Mm -hmm. um, I would take them at their word. Um, if they're saying that, then it's probably a plastic that you um, wouldn't want in your, uh, <laughs> if it says don't reuse it, I probably just wouldn't, I wouldn't, I not know what I wouldn't reuse it, but I would try to stay away from it. Because um, there's, there's different, you know, there's different ones out there um, and they have different features and they have different um, possible toxins um, associated with them. So that's just my personal take. Um, Judith Morris asked about um, what plastic films are okay to recycle. Plastic films. So when it comes to plastic films, think of the, remember the, the, the think of all the grocery bags that you've gotten. Okay. Um, whether it's from the produce or the little white bags that you'd get if you went into the grocery store, those kind of film plastics were okay. Those are, those can be recycled. Okay. So if it's a, if it's a plastic where you can put your finger in and it stretches. All right. So those kind, if it's crinkly, it's not. So we don't want those. So you probably want to stand, uh, stay, steer towards, um, the lighter colors, like either clear or white, um, typically. But there's, you know, there are certainly some black ones as well that, that can, uh, you know, be recycled. But the main thing is that they're clean. You got to be really clean and dry. I'm trying to also look at that website. Do you remember? Is it plasticfilmrecycling.org? I think um, that gives you just a rundown of all the things they accept. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um. Let's see what else. Um, why doesn't recycling glass save more energy? That's a great question. I think it's because um, it's the, the, I think most of the energy as, uh, associated with glass making is in the heating process when you're making, actually making the glass. So what you're doing by giving them the glass is you're avoiding them having to scoop it up from a beach somewhere and bring it to the place where they make glass. So there's a value in that, in that, that they do save energy by using those glass bottles, because it's, you're, you're avoiding that piece and it takes less energy to take a glass and turn it into another glass versus taking sand and turning it into a glass. Does that make sense? But it's not huge. It's just not, there's just not that much difference. So they both require, you know, quite a bit of energy. But um, there's some that are dramatic, like aluminum. Mm -hmm. And then Jay has a question about mattress recycling. Can it be done? Can it and be done? Boy, it can be done. They're doing it really well down in Eugene at, at St. Vincent de Paul. They have their mattress recycling going there. Um, if there's a fee associated with it, and ideally, uh, it would be nice if we could get something up here as well, because I think the St. Vincent de Paul has, I mean, they're, they're pretty much a capacity. They're getting a lot of stuff right from the landfill because they're encouraging uh, those mattresses get, get recycled. And so they can recycle, uh, approximately 95% of every mattress can be recycled. So everything pulls out of it. You think of those old mattresses and they can still pull out, you know, the wood, the springs, the batting. Uh, if it's a foam mattress, they can still, re, you know, they can still recycle that foam. So there's a lot of possibilities with that. And I, and they would really, that's, that's one of the ones that are, was up for extended producer responsibility legislation. It didn't quite, didn't quite make it the last round because of the, uh, the way that it all went down when people walked out of the building at the Capitol. Uh, they're hoping to reintroduce that legislation, which would establish a process for all mattresses to be recycled in the state of Oregon, um, which would be ideal because it's a, it's a, you know, it's, everybody's got a mattress practically, right? 
Um, and so here's this, this material that is basically going into a landfill most of the time around the state. And it, uh, the landfill people hate them because they actually, they're kind of like, um, uh, you know, it's, it, it's like cream. It rises to the top, even though they're landfills, just kind of with those springs and whatnot, it just comes to work its way back up. So uh, they, don't, they don't like them. So it, it, it takes up a lot of space and there's a lot of great materials to recover. Yeah, I believe that you could take them to St. Vincent de Paul. This is pre-COVID. I haven't checked after, and um, I think it's ten dollars each mattress, and then they'll haul it down to Eugene to recycle. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think about that, it's if you take it out to the landfill here in Marion County, it's twenty-five dollars just to take it out there. So if you can get get them to recycle it for ten, just just for you, besides the fact that it's getting recovered versus burned, uh, that's a plus. Plus for the environment, plus for you. And Kate said she believes they're not accepting any mattresses right now because of COVID. That's good to know. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Oh, let me see. I think there was one before this. Oh, would you recommend purchasing water from aluminum cans rather than plastic? Alan? I'm, well, I'm thinking about that one. Um, I, I would have a hard time just recommending uh, either one. Per, it's just it's a personal thing. And then I think of environmentally, if we're just going to go with that, it's pretty close. Uh, probably, probably, probably better to go environmentally, probably go for plastic if we're just talking about greenhouse gases. But we start talking about toxins, maybe it's better aluminum. I don't, I don't know. It's a tough one. I just, I just go with tap water. So. Um, and then Jay also has a comment or suggestion. He, he lives on the way to the transfer station and a tremendous amount of materials heading in that direction, especially during the stay at home orders for COVID. Um, and then he, understands that there's liability issues about dumpster diving, but is there a way that we can permit limited reuse of materials? And he also asked about household hazardous waste for that reason as well. Yeah, well, um, reuse of materials. So you're, you're absolutely right, Jay, the, the, because of the, since people have been staying at home, the, the, the residential amount of garbage has gone up tremendously about, I think about 30% more. And the, uh, the commercial side has dropped, uh, obviously, because a lot of close, there's been a lot of closures there. And so a lot of folks are, the, the, the number of people driving out to the transfer stations has just been enormous. There's huge numbers. We've set records uh, this, this, these past few months. And there is, uh, when people take this stuff out there, what a lot of us aren't aware of is that when it gets thrown into the, into the, the heap down below, that material is then is taken out to the, um, the Brooks Materials Recovery Facility. And so they are gonna, they're gonna get a second look there. They're gonna go through it and they'll pull out probably 25% of the materials that are in there. So they're pulling out, you know, concrete, wood, um, help me Jessica, any, anything that might be a, um, uh, I'm just drawing a blank here all of a sudden, but there's like, six materials that they're pulling out for money. Right. Um, it's not coming to my mind. Yard either. debris, just, yep. just a lot of stuff that they can, uh, that's got, a, that's, that's actually got a value as a, not being in there. Oh, um, uh, wall board, you know, gypsum board. Oh, gypsum. So a lot of that stuff is, is finding another home. So there's that piece. Um, and as far as just letting dumpster diving go, um, yeah, that is a huge liability piece. I know that Jessica, you you probably investigated that, trying to do some art projects or something, right? We're looking in to get folks to to make material, make something out art out of out of uh, recovered materials. So it's um, it's hard to get people to allow you to do that. We're also just, I think, um, dealing with capacity issues with that site, as well as our other sites. Of they're not designed for that, essentially. Yeah. So. Um, for instance, people are waiting in long lines trying to uh, even get to the pit at this point to dispose of things. So we're asking people to not go there and use that as a um, hold off on, you know, 
putting things out into the pit right now um, and taking it to the transfer station as much as possible um, and trying to reduce that that want to spring clean. Um, but you also mentioned, Jay, the, the hazardous waste facility. Yeah. They do put materials out. Um, if, if you came through and let's say you had a bottle of, I don't know, um, turpentine, okay, and you just weren't yeah. going to use that rest of that can and it, the can's still intact um, and it's still got the labels on it and it's clean, they would put that out for somebody else to come along going, oh, I've been needing some turpentine and I, to you reuse it. Um, they yeah, have that, that changed in our yeah. recent contracting. Um, and there's liability issues with that, just so you know. Um, oh, so I don't think oh, that- Old would, news. Yeah, I know. Update. <laughs> okay. um, I think that, that sharing table has changed, unfortunately. Um, and that might be something that we would like to put back into place. So if, if you have feelings about that, that would be good to know. Do you, do you think, Jessica, that that's, is that on the table to bring that back? I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I believe in the power of people. <laughs> and I think, I think also this is really good information to rethink of at some point we are going to need to make a new transfer station that we can start talking about the reuse of materials um, in that planning. And I know that um, our boss would love to hear your voices about that. Yeah, yeah, I see Kate saying, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I think that recovery piece is huge. So um, they would love to get more feedback from the community about that. Absolutely. All right, trying to, once the secondhand stores are open again, accepting donations, the transfer stations will probably go back to normal. We're kind of hoping that, um, yeah. And yeah. I did read that I think all of the um, Goodwills are now open now in Salem. I know West Salem was the first one to open, but now I think all of them, South Salem's open, one out of Lancaster's open. So those are available. Uh, some of the smaller ones may not have opened yet. Um, it's going to be a case by case basis. But definitely, I mean, I know a lot of people rely on that as an opportunity to, you know, to move something out into the reuse. And there's also a, a Reuse Salem or Don't Buy Salem. What is the name of that uh, Facebook page, Jessica? Yeah, why can't I think of it either? But yeah, it's um, Don't Buy. Gosh, it's, I'll think of it in a Write minute. It down, Kate. <laughs> what is it, Kate? I'm going to unmute you, Kate. What is it? Hang on. Um, buy nothing. Yes, I can read lips. Buy nothing. Good call, Kate. <laughs> buy nothing. So if you go to buy nothing on Facebook, you can you, it can be either Salem or it can be uh, other other areas too. And they have different ones in Salem. They have like South Salem, North Salem. There's probably ones in Kaiser. There's probably one in Staten. There's, I mean, I'm guessing. I've only looked at the ones in Salem because uh, that's where I live. But uh, that's also pretty cool. People just throw stuff out there, and there's usually somebody gets it pretty fast. So there's stuff you can you can even find stuff that you might like or I mean people didn't give away you know they're 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 making they make too many jars of, of, of fruit cocktail or something and say anybody want three jars of fruit cocktail whatever so it's pretty cool it is very cool um, there's some good ideas about Jay about if we do bring back that sharing table they could do an inventory and make that available for people to see and if you publish it. Does Habitat accept household hazardous waste? Uh, no, they don't. They will not take that. Um, just so as you know, I mean that one of the cool things, hopefully when we get to, if we, especially if we ever move the household hazardous waste facility, um, we'll have a, a place where people can go in. When I visited the one in, in um, Boulder, Colorado, it actually was like a store with shelves with all their stuff up there and it was all free. People could go in and, and shop for their, you know, the hazardous materials that were placed there, whether it was, you know, and even even paints were included in that. So there's always always uh, stuff to ways to improve, and hopefully we'll get there. All right. But I'm sad I didn't know that, Jessica. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right. I That's feel like when we, we we're we're working from home now, so sometimes we're a little bit. I know we usually share everything a lot. Yes. So, and I, I can't remember if that was contract issues or what. So, um, yeah, they are switching out from Clean Harbors to Stairs. Right. 
or it might have also been um, people storing mass quantities of stuff and they were worried about the health and safety of that as well. Um, uh, it, yeah, my memory's just shot. Great, fine, nothing is awesome. Agreed. Cool. And that's all I had. I see on the, the chat, Alan. Okay. Well, you guys, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been fun. I know um, it, it's, uh, it's always awkward, you know, talking. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, uh, looking, you know, talking from uh, a, a kind of a, a, a muted group. But uh, I do appreciate you attending and hopefully you take some of these ideas out and we hear back from you and you contact the people that have you know, some of the powers besides, you know, uh, to help change whatever, whatever can be changed in a positive way. Thanks, Alan. Thank you all. And I'm going to end this meeting as of now. Bye, you guys. Bye. Hi, Kathy. Bye, you guys.